Okay, well, let's get started then. Uh, just to recap, since it's been a little while, we made it through book one, in which Socrates defeated Polemarchus, Cephalus, Thrasymachus in argument. I tried to convince you that he was using some fishy arguments to draw Glaucon and Adamantus into the conversation, which was successful, because when book two kicked off, we have Glaucon and Adamantus now pressing Socrates to defend justice on its own merits. Book two was concerned a little bit with doing that. The myth of Gyges, the ring of Gyges, was brought up as an argument that people aren't just because they want to be or should be. They're just because of consequences of being unjust and they're afraid what people will do or think about them if they don't do the right thing. Book two ended with Socrates continuing his discussion of the kind of education that the guardians in our society should receive. Remember, the guardians are kind of the poet soldiers in this ideal city. They're the literally second class citizens on the tripartite, the three-tiered hierarchy with philosopher kings at the top and the producers at the bottom. So we're starting book three off. Who would like to be Adamantus? We'll just read a little bit and I'll interject where some notable things are occurring. Yeah? Okay, cool. Socrates' narration continues. Where the gods are concerned then, it seems that those are the sorts of stories the future guardians should and should not hear from childhood on, if they are to honor the gods and their parents, and not treat lightly their friendship with one another. Recall, what Socrates said is that the guardians should not be exposed to any stories that portray the gods or the heroes in a bad light, right? Only moral, just, virtuous stories. What about if they are to be courageous? Shouldn't they be told stories that will make them least likely to fear death? Or do you think that anyone ever becomes courageous if he has that fear in his heart? No, I think so. Ah, okay, so there's something interesting going on here that you wouldn't recognize unless you have read philosophy, unless you are familiar with some philosophies of death and what it means to do philosophy. A lot of philosophers throughout history have argued that the purpose of studying philosophy is learning how to die well. There's a similar idea being evoked here. He's saying, shouldn't we tell the guardians certain stories so that they won't fear death? They should receive a certain education so that they're courageous. Adamantus agrees, of course, that it would not be good if our soldier guardians had a fear of death or combat. Because that's their whole job, is to look death in the face right, and defend their people. What about if someone believes that Hades exists... And is full of terrible things. Can anyone with that fear be unafraid of death and prefer it to defeat in battle and slavery? Not at all. Ah, so here what we see Socrates doing is he's pushing for a recontextualization of death and the Greek polytheistic relationship between death and the gods. So he's saying we need to tell them stories so that they don't fear death and they don't think the afterlife is going to do them harm. Then we must also supervise those who try to tell such stories, it seems, and ask them not to disparage the life in Hades in this undiscriminating way, but to speak well of it, since what they now tell us is neither true nor beneficial to future warriors. We will start with the following lines then and expunge everything like them. I would rather labor on earth in another man's service, a man who is landless, with little to live on, than be king over all the dead. In this, he feared that his home should be revealed to mortals and immortals as dreadful, dank, and hated even by the gods. Dank as in, you know, bad, not like, dank, bro, right? And alas, there survives in the halls of Hades a soul, a mere phantasm with its wits completely gone. And this, he alone can think others to be flitting shadows, 
And the soul, leaving his limbs, made its way to Hades, lamenting its fate, leaving manhood and youth behind. And this, his soul went below the earth like smoke, screeching as it went. And as when bats in an awful cave fly around screeching if one of them falls from the cluster on the ceiling, all clinging to one another, so their souls went screeching. So Socrates here is saying, We need to tell the guardians a certain story, not only about death, but Hades. If you know anything about Greek polytheism, Hades is not portrayed in a great light. Hades is not like hell, where people are going to be tormented and tortured for all eternity. Rather, the conception of the day was, if you were not an amazing, virtuous, heroic person, you would go to Hades and you would kind of lose your consciousness and just kind of be like a zombie wandering around down there. Whereas the people who were virtuous, warriors, strong and heroic and brave would ended up going to the Elysian fields, which is akin to like heaven or paradise, if you think about it in Christian terms. So he's saying we need to, we need to get rid of this idea that people are going to be wandering around like zombies in Hades. Okay. We will beg Homer and the rest of the poets not to be angry if we delete these and all similar passages. Not because they are not poetic and pleasing to the masses when they hear them, but because the more poetic they are, the more they should be kept away from the ears of children and men who are to be free and to fear slavery more than death. Absolutely. So let me stop here and ask you a question. Why should poetic things be kept away from children? He's saying, look, these stories are pleasing to the masses, but the more poetic they are, the more they should be kept away from the ears of children and the guardians. Why? Children are like gullible, right, right, or they might get the wrong message from them. And there's also another reason. What is the relationship that we've kind of been talking about this whole time between philosophy and poetry? Which actually gets at the truth? What is it? Philosophy, Philosophy, yeah, yeah. What poets do (coughs) is they create fictional accounts of things. Okay, they might be based on real events sometimes, but a lot of it is fiction, and a lot of them are mere images. Okay, remember what we're after is truth, knowledge. We're not going to get the requisite knowledge to live our lives well from just being fed images of things, right? We need the true, the accurate, the real, which is what we get access to through philosophy, not poetry. Then, in addition, we must also get rid of the terrible and frightening names that occur in such passages. Cockatus, Styx, Those Below, the Sapless Ones, and all the other names of the same pattern that supposedly makes everyone who hears them shudder. Perhaps they are useful for other purposes, but our fear is that all shuddering will make our guardians more emotional and soft than they ought to be. And our fear is justified. Should we remove them, then? And follow the opposite pattern in speech and poetry? Clearly. Shall we also remove the lamentations and pitiful speeches of famous men? If what we did before was necessary, so is that. Consider, though, whether we will be right to remove them or not. What we claim is that a good man won't think that death is a terrible thing for another good one to suffer, even if the latter happens to be his friend. So he won't mourn for his friend as if he had suffered a terrible fate. Certainly not. But we also claim this. A good person is most self-sufficient when it comes to living well and is distinguished from other people by having the least need of anyone or anything else. True. So it is less terrible for him than for anyone else to be deprived of a son, brother, possessions, or the like. So he will lament it the least and bear it the most calmly when some such misfortune overtakes him. Of course. Ah, so we would be right then to remove the lamentations of famous men. 
We would leave them to women, provided they are not excellent women, and cowardly men, so that those we say we are training to guard our land will feel disgust at doing such things. What does he mean by lamentations? What are lamentations? It is a book in the Bible, yes, but more than that. Yeah, it's like, oh, life is hard and it sucks and my brother died. And that's a lamentation, okay? It's somebody yelling out and mourning and complaining about life, okay? We don't want our guardians to be this way, Socrates says. We want them to be strong and stoic, able to fear death in the face and conquer it. Face death. Whatever. Whatever. We don't want them to be soft and emotional. In addition, then, we will have to ask Homer and the other poets not to represent Achilles, who is the son of a goddess, as lying now on his side, now on his back, now again on his belly, then standing up to wander distracted this way and that on the shore of the unharvested sea. What does this image evoke to you? What is Achilles doing here? wandering around on his back, on his side, on his belly. What does it seem like he's doing? Like he's withering in pain. Right, yeah. Oh, it hurts, you know, tossing back and forth. Wander distracted this way and that. Wandering without purpose. Going through life without having a set goal, a set purpose that you're walking towards, the guardians will have a purpose. They should not wander through life. Or to make him pick up ashes with both hands and pour them over his head, weeping and lamenting to the extent and in the manner Homer describes. Or to represent Priam, a close descendant of the gods, as begging and rolling around in dung as he calls upon each of his men by name, calling out for help. Right? And yet, more insistently than that, we will ask them at least not to make the gods lament and say, Woe is me, unfortunate that I am, wretched mother of a great son. But if they do make the gods do such things, at least they must not dare to represent the greatest of the gods in so unlikely a fashion as to make him say, Alas, with my own eyes I see a man who is most dear to me, being chased around the city, and my heart laments. Or woe is me that Sarpedon, who is most dear to me, should be fated to be killed by Patroclus, the son of Menoetius. However the hell you pronounce that. You see, my dear Adamantus, if our young people listen seriously to these stories without ridiculing them, is not worth hearing, none of them is going to consider such things to be unworthy of a mere human being like himself or rebuke himself if it occurred to him to do or say any of them. On the contrary, without shame or perseverance, he would chant many dirges and laments at the slightest sufferings. That's absolutely true. Do you have people in your life that are like this? That whine and complain about everything? Do you like them? Are they fun to be around? No. They're not fun to be around. They're not going to do their job well because they're busy complaining all the time. All right, so Socrates is like, we don't want that. That's bad. But that must not happen, as our argument has shown, and we must remain persuaded by it until someone shows us a better one. No, they must not. Moreover, they must not be lovers of laughter either. For whenever anyone gives in to violent laughter, a violent reaction pretty much always follows. What's the big deal about laughter? Why can't they be lovers of laughter? Isn't it fun to joke around and be happy and laugh? What's wrong with being a lover of laughter? The key is in that second sentence. Anybody got any ideas? Yeah? I mean, I guess if you're like laughing at somebody uh, and they're like upset about it, they could have like a violent reaction. 
Yeah, yeah, you don't want to teach people to laugh at the misfortune of others, right? That's not cool. But also being a lover of laughter that Socrates describes here is not the kind of character that we want our guardians to have. Why? He describes a lover of laughter as when, when, they're, when they give in to violent laughter, a violent reaction pretty much always follows. Violent laughter, like an uncontrollable laughter, like you can't control yourself. That's not cool. Okay, Our guardians are supposed to be stoic, strong, disciplined, self-controlled individuals. Somebody who gives in to violent fits of laughter and can't stop themselves, like they just smoked a bowl, is somebody who doesn't have control over themselves. Okay, So we want our guardians to have self-discipline and self-control. That means having control over one's reactions to things, like laughter like misfortune, okay? So if someone represents worthwhile people as overcome by laughter, we must not accept it. And we will accept it even less if they represent the gods in that way. Then we must not accept the following sorts of sayings about the gods from Homer. And unquenchable laughter arose amongst the blessed gods as they saw Hephaestus limping through the hall. According to your argument, they must be rejected. Look at how the gods are portrayed in this saying. They laughed unquenchably as they saw Hephaestus, who is an ugly guy, who is kind of deformed, limping through the hall. What a bunch of assholes, right? Are you going to laugh at someone who's limping, walking in front of you? What a dick thing to do, right? So the gods are not being cool here, right? They don't have control over themselves. They don't have decorum. They don't have proper manners and respects for Hephaestus. In fact, a lot of them hate him because he's ugly, which is not cool. All right. Moreover, we have to be concerned about truth as well. For if what we just said now is correct, and a lie is really useless to the gods, but useful to human beings as a form of drug, it is clear that it must be assigned to doctors, whereas private individuals must have nothing to do with it. It is appropriate for the rulers then, if anyone, to lie because of enemies or citizens for the good of the city. Remember, this is the noble lie, right? Socrates has been defending the lie that the authorities might use to keep people in line and to keep them happy if it's for their good, if it's for their benefit. But no one else may have anything to do with lies, certainly not the common people. On the contrary, we will say that for a private individual, the lie to such rulers is as bad a mistake as for a sick person not to tell his doctor or an athlete, his trainer, the truth about his physical condition, or for someone not to tell the captain the things that are true about the ship and the sailors, or about he himself or one of his fellow sailors is faring. Indeed, it is a worse mistake. That's absolutely true. So if anyone else but the rulers, is caught telling lies in the city, any of the craftsmen, whether a prophet, a doctor who heals the sick, or a carpenter who works in wood, he will be punished for introducing a practice that is as subversive and destructive of a city as of a ship. Indeed it is, at any rate, if what people do is influenced by what he says. What do you think about this? Should people be punished for lying? We don't have any laws against lying in our society, right? You can lie to your parents, you can lie to your friends or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Should there be punishments for lying? What do you think? I mean, in, in some scenarios, you uh, are allowed to lie legally. Like what? Can you think of any? Like to a federal officer in question after mm. you've taken a or anything under that sort of like legal area. Right. I don't know if Socrates is talking about outlying lying necessarily, but he's saying that anybody who lies should be punished for that. I think it depends if the lying has like consequences. Like the okay. girlfriend, she doesn't look bad in that dress. Like there's no negative consequence necessarily to lying versus telling your friend, hey, see that stack of money over there, that's free for the taking, when it's like not, and then you get your friend in trouble. <laughs> 
Yeah. Something like that. That if if your lie causes a negative reaction, that that's bad. That's bad. Do you think it should be punished? Okay, and maybe you might say, maybe it should be punished, but maybe, like, not by the government or something. Maybe we should just be like, shame, shame, punish them that way, maybe. It's also just, like, um, a lot of people lie to protect themselves, so mm. situation lying, and then it's a form of self-defense. So if they were to try to attempt to outlaw lying, first of all, we'd also have to deal with the consequences of accusations. It's um, human nature in itself is kind of almost Mm. And so we could genuinely believe that someone's lying, but they could be telling the truth, and we would honestly probably never know unless we had evidence to back it up. So we could, that could honestly rabbit hole into like a, say, the witch trial situation, ah. uh, where it's just like, they're lying, no, I'm not, type of thing. And then um, it could also lead to just like a permanent distrust of other people and their words. And if we were to consider um, like defense lying, so lying to protect yourself. Um, so like obviously, you know, someone comes up to you at Walmart and they go, oh, you live around here. No, I don't, I'm just in the area. Like, no, you, you lie to protect yourself. You know? uh. So um, would that be okay? Would they, or would they have to individually look at each offense committed and go from there? That's a good question. He says here that anybody who's caught lying will be punished. So I think he's even thinking about little white lies too because they're subversive. Because once you allow people to lie without punishment, your, your community is going to unravel. If one person gets away with it, then other people will start lying, right? Because maybe they can get away with it. Mm. But we kind of have laws in our society that, like, a doctor can't lie to a patient. Like, uh, someone, like, a, a carpenter can lie to the people that are building the court. Like, they can't intentionally lie and get in trouble for that. So I think he's specifically talking about whatever occupation or, like, whatever class of society you're in, you thought those, like, producers, I guess you call them, they can't necessarily lie in the craft that they're working in. And then if we interpret it that way, maybe what he's saying doesn't sound so crazy. Yeah, because you don't want your doctor lying to you, right? You don't want a shipbuilder saying, oh, yeah, you know, I built this ship to hold 500 men when it can only hold 50, right? That would be a disaster. So... Right. Yeah, maybe maybe it's not so much a problem if people are more virtuous and they all love each other and stuff and they're looking out for one another. But obviously we don't live in an ideal world, so... Yeah, his, I'd say his biggest flaw about his entire perception of how society should be is not the way that he thinks it should be, but it's the way that he thinks it should be. Mm. Because I think that the way that he has it in like a tripartite system, it's the way that he can, is, he can and is assuming that people are good of nature, people are virtuous, people... Mm. Mm. And I don't think he really understands that. Okay. I, I think Socrates would, would try to push back on that a little bit by saying, this is why education is so important. Like the whole reason this whole chapter, book, is about education is because as long as we can educate people right and nurture them right, then they will do the right thing. But if you don't educate them properly, if you feed them false information then yeah, they are going to be more gray. And then you have disorder in the city. Do you think education is that powerful? In some cases, yes. Um, and people are so affected by their environments and how their environment makes them think. Like, a lot of people have the same political opinions as their parents. So right. Like they grow up, the way they're um, nurtured into that environment is what they believe. That's how they were raised. Um, but again, a lot of people do stray from that. People 
are again inherently curious. People mm. want to know why we are the way we are, or why like the sky is blue, why our parents think the way they do. People want to know, and so I think that curiosity can't be snuffed out by limiting and censorship. Mm. Okay. I think it'll only encourage it more with more censorship. Mm. Yeah, hold on to that thought. We'll come back to it. Do you want to say one more thing? Um, yeah, I, I think that all of, like those negative things about us, like greed and all of that, I think that's learned. You know, I don't think we just like came onto the world greedy and bad. You know, and when you said that, we're naturally curious. I think, yeah, definitely we are. But I wouldn't suggest that like we're naturally good or bad. Okay. More of like a blank slate. Okay. Yeah, very lock-in view of, uh, of human nature. Socrates is going to say something similar when he stresses the importance of education. Um, I don't think he thinks people are naturally bad either. But people are self-interested, right? So we need to account for that. Okay. What about temperance? Won't our young people also need that? What is temperance? This isn't a word that you hear often nowadays. What do we mean when we say the weather is temperate? The mild. Yeah, or fair, you know, not too hot, not too cold. Temperance is something similar but applied to the human character. Okay? Temperance has to do with Moderation, right? Not having explosive, violent, emotional reactions to things. Not having no reaction to things. Associated with temperance is self-mastery, self-discipline, good sense, reasonableness, moderation. Having control over your inner desires and urges. And acting in an appropriate way to what life throws at you, okay? Not being a glutton, not being too lazy, but being even keel. And don't the greatest parts of temperance, at any rate for the majority of people, consist in obedience to the rulers and ruling over the pleasures of drink, sex, and food for themselves? So we will claim, I imagine, that it is fine to say the sort of thing that Diomedes says in Homer. Sit down in silence, my friend, and be persuaded by my story. And what follows it? The Achaeans went in silently, breathing valor, afraid of their commanders. Yes, it is fine. But what about things like, you drunkard, with the eyes of a dog and the heart of a deer? And what follows it? Are they then fine things to say? And what about all the other headstrong things that private individuals say to their rulers in works of prose or poetry? No, they are not fine. Okay, so Socrates is like, look, you don't just insult people. All right, that's not being temperate. You might even say, if you think a little bit more about what private individuals say, Socrates might say, look, locker room talk ain't cool. Okay, you could imagine him saying that. You can, and you could imagine him saying, just as he implies here, that saying headstrong, nasty, critical things that aren't meant to build people up also is intemperate. Okay? We shouldn't be doing that. That, I imagine, is because they are not suitable for inculcating temperance in the young people who hear them. But it would not be surprising if they were found pleasant in some other context. What do you think? What about making the wisest man say that the best thing of all, as it seems to him, is when, quote, the tables are well laden with bread and meat, and the wine bearer draws wine from the mixing bowl, brings it, and pours it in the cups? Do you think that hearing things like that is suitable for inculcating self-mastery in young people? Or that death by starvation is the most pitiful fate? Or how about Zeus... How Zeus stayed awake alone, deliberating when all the other gods and mortals were asleep, and then easily forgot all his plans because of his sexual appetite, and was so overcome by the sight of Hera 
that he did not even want to go to their bedroom, but to possess her there on the ground, saying that his appetite for her was even greater than it was when they first made love to one another, quote, without their parents' knowledge. Or what about the chaining together of Ares and Aphrodite by Hephaestus for similar reasons? On the other hand, if there are any words or deeds of famous men that express perseverance in the face of everything, surely they must be seen and heard. For example, he struck his chest and spoke to his heart, Bear up, my heart, you have suffered more shameful things than this. Absolutely. And we must not, of course, allow our men to be bribable with gifts or to be money lovers. Certainly not. Ah, So Socrates here is drawing out some of the characteristics that the guardians should have. Perseverance, right? Grit, tenacity, right? These are all associated with that first passage, strength. And then in the second one, we must not allow our men to be bribable with gifts or to be money lovers. He's not talking just about greed for money here. There's something a little bit deeper also going on. In Plato's philosophy, what's more important? Training the spirit to be well-ordered or the soul or the body? The spirit, right? That is the seat of consciousness. That is what rules over the rest of our body, right? It's your spirit or your soul, whatever you want to call it, that moves your body, right? Right? So you've got to get that well-ordered. You've got to get that good. What he's also saying here is not only do we want them to be lovers of money, but we want to teach them not to prioritize material things in general highly. More than immaterial things. Like the virtues. Like courage. Like justice. Right? Like being a good person. All of that stuff, which is not material which is not a physical thing in the world, is more important than physical shit, like treasures, like wealth, like fancy luxurious pillows, okay? The immaterial things matter more than the material things. He's also getting at this by saying they shouldn't be bribable and lovers of money. We need to inculcate the guardians so that they value the immaterial things more than the material things. Then they must not sing, gifts persuade gods and gifts persuade revered kings. Nor must we praise Phoenix, the tutor of Achilles, for being moderate when he advises advises Achilles to take the gifts and defend the Achaeans, but not to lay aside his anger without gifts. Nor should we agree that Achilles himself was such a money lover as to accept the gifts of Agamemnon, or to release a corpse when he got paid for it, but otherwise to refuse." It is only out of respect for Homer indeed that I hesitate to say that it is positively impious to accuse Achilles of such things or to believe them when others say them or to believe that he said to Apollo, you have injured me, far shooter, most deadly of the gods, and I would punish you if only I had the power. What's bad about that? Why don't we want our guardians thinking or behaving like that? What is wrong or bad or off about what Achilles just said there to Apollo? Did he kind of like threaten him? Like, I would punish you if I had the power. Like, he's opposing <laughs> at the gods. Right. He's leveling a threat, right? He's fighting against the gods here in his speech, implying that he's going to fight against them physically. He's defying the gods. These are things that we don't want to inculcate into the guardians. Because remember, we're going to teach the guardians that the gods are good, that all good things come come from the gods. You shouldn't want to defy them. You shouldn't threaten them. You shouldn't insult them. All right? Bad form. Not cool. Or that he disobeyed the river, who was a god, and was ready to fight it. Again. Or that he consecrated hair to the dead, Patroclus, 
which he had already consecrated to the other river, Sphercius. To the hero Patroclus, I give my hair to take with him. What's bad about that? This whole hair thing. What does it mean to consecrate something? Does anybody know? Consecrate. It's not a word you hear a lot, huh? Yeah, yeah, it it has a kind of religious or spiritual connotation. It means to, like, make sacred or make holy. Yeah. So what has Achilles done here? He consecrated his hair. He promised it to someone after he already consecrated it to something else. He's not following the religious rituals and rites properly. He's breaking a promise here, right? Right? We don't want the guardians to break their promises. We don't want people to think that's okay. We want people to follow the religious uh, rites properly. We must not believe that he did that. Nor is it true that he dragged the dead Hector around the tomb of Patroclus or massacred the captives on his pyre. Okay, what's bad about that? Is it a nice, good thing to drag a a body around, a dead body around behind your chariot? As like a hoorah, look what I did, ha ha. Is that cool? No, right? That's bad form, okay? You don't drag around a dead body behind you saying hoorah because you killed him. You show respect to the dead. You show respect even to your fallen enemies who you best in battle. Okay? Here, what Achilles is doing is he's disrespecting the dead. And then what does it say he did? Or massacred the captives on his pyre. What did it say he he did to the captives? How? What is a pyre? Yeah, like burned them alive. You gonna are you gonna burn you know the captives of war alive? That no, that's not good. All right, Socrates is saying this is not good, people. You don't do this. Okay, maybe you take them as slaves, as was common back during that time, but you don't burn them alive. Right? At least if they're slaves that they can live and maybe someday get their freedom. Obviously, we would not agree with slavery. but So we will deny these things. Nor will we allow our people to believe that Achilles, the son of a goddess, and of Peleus, who was himself the most temperate of men and the grandson of Zeus, and the pupil of the most wise Chiron, was so full of inner disorder as to have two opposite diseases within him. Illiberality, accompanied by the love of money on the one hand, and arrogance toward gods and humans on the other. Moreover, we will neither believe nor allow it to be said that Theseus, the son of Poseidon, and Perithus, the son of Zeus, ever attempted those terrible rapes, nor that any other child of a god and hero dared to do any of the terrible and impious deeds that are now falsely attributed to them. Rape is not cool, guys. Right? Socrates is saying, look, we don't want the people to believe that the gods are going around raping each other or raping people. All right, sexual assault is not good. Rape is not good. And what are some of the other um, impious deeds that the gods have done in these stories? Well, murder, robbery, Betrayal, deceit, all of these are bad. All right, We don't want our people, most of all our guardians, having bad characters. Because again, they're supposed to be the policemen and the soldiers. Can you imagine if the policemen and the soldiers were terrible, vicious people? Does that ring true for anybody today? It's not good. We will compel the poets either to deny that they did such things or else to deny that they were children of the gods. 
But they must not say both or attempt to persuade our young people that the gods produce evils, nor that heroes are no better than humans. After all, as we were saying earlier, these things are neither pious nor true. For we demonstrated, I take it, that it is impossible for the gods to produce evils. And they are also positively harmful to those who hear them. You see, everyone will be ready to excuse himself when he is bad, if he has been persuaded that similar things are done and were done by close descendants of the gods, near kin of Zeus, whose ancestral altar is in the ether on Ida's peak, and in whom the blood of daemons has not weakened. That is why we must put a stop to such stories. If we do not, they will produce in our young people a very casual attitude to evil. Exactly. Just think about the kinds of stories and movies and TV shows that kids watch. Do you want your children, you know, watching Friday the 13th when they're five years old? Or Machete? No, those are really violent, gory things, and they might romanticize those things in the forms of media to kids, right? You don't want kids adopting those views towards violence, those nonchalant views, or thinking that deceit, betrayal, murder, sexual assault is okay. So what kind of stories are still left then about which we must determine whether or not they may be told? I mean, we have discussed how gods, heroes, daemons, and things in Hades should be portrayed. Then wouldn't stories about human beings be left? But it is not possible, my friend, to discuss them here. Why not? Because what we are going to say, I imagine, is that poets and prose writers get the greatest things concerning human beings wrong. They say that many unjust people are happy and many just ones wretched, that doing injustice is profitable if it escapes detection, and that justice is another's good but one's own loss. We will forbid them to say such things, I imagine, and order them to sing and tell the opposite. Don't you think so? No, I know so. Oh, very confident. Well then, if you agree that what I said is correct... Won't I say to you that you have conceded the point we were investigating all along? And your plan would be correct. Then, we won't come to an agreement about what stories should be told about human beings until we have discovered what sort of thing justice is and how, given its nature, it profits the one who has it, whether he is believed to be just or not. That's absolutely right. Our discussion of the content of stories is complete then. Our next task, I take it, is to investigate their style. And then we will have completely investigated both what they should say and how they should say it. I don't understand you. So we're going to skip ahead a little bit because Socrates is just trying to explain to Adamantus here what he's getting at. So we're going to skip to 394D which is at the bottom of page 75. What I meant then was just this. We need to come to an agreement about whether to allow our poets to narrate as imitators or as imitators of some things but not others, and what sorts of things these are, or to not allow them to imitate at all. Perhaps so, but it may be an even wider question than that. I really do not know yet, but wherever the wind of argument blows us, so to speak, that is where we must go. Yes. So we're investigating now how we are going to tell the guardians these stories. We're going to have storytellers in our society and elders and people who are going to be educating the young people, telling them these stories. Do we want those storytellers to imitate what's going on in the story? Or do we want them to tell the story as if they're at a distance from it, third person? So do you want somebody who's an actor acting out the story? Or should we want someone who's just telling the story as if they weren't there? 
Socrates is going to say, we better not let our storytellers imitate some things. That would not be good. It's going to depend, of course, on the content. What I want you to consider then, Adamantus, is whether our guardians should be imitators or not. Or does the answer follow from what we have said already? Namely, that whereas each individual can practice one pursuit well, he cannot practice many well. And if he tried to do this and dabbled in many things, he would surely fail to achieve distinction in all of them. Of course. Why it? Then doesn't the same principle also apply to imitation? Namely, that a single individual cannot imitate many things as well as he can imitate one? Then he will hardly be able to practice any pursuit worth talking about while at the same time imitating lots of things and being an imitator. So the worry is if we have storytellers who are imitators, that might inspire our guardians to be imitators, but that wouldn't be good. Remember, because each person can only do one craft extremely well, and if someone's trying to be an imitator, they're spreading themselves thin, right? They're not working on their craft. They're trying to become some sort of jack of all trades, but that doesn't fly, okay? That doesn't work well. Um, For as you know, even when two sorts of imitation are thought to be closely akin, the same people are not able to practice both of them well simultaneously. The writing of tragedy and comedy is an example. Didn't you just call both of these imitations? I did, and you are quite right. The same people cannot do both. Nor can they be both rhapsodes and actors simultaneously. True. They cannot be somebody uh, reciting an epic poem from memory and being somebody who's like a good actor. Right? If they're going to do one of these things well, the other one is going to suffer. Indeed, the same men cannot be used as both tragic and comic actors. And all these are imitations, aren't they? They are. And human nature, Adamantus, seems to me to be minted in even smaller coins than this, so that an individual can neither imitate many things well, nor perform well the actions themselves of which those imitations are likenesses. That's absolutely true. So if we are to preserve our first argument that our guardians must be kept away from all other crafts so as to be the most exact craftsmen of the city's freedom and practice nothing at all except what contributes to this, then they must neither do nor imitate anything else. But if they imitate anything, they must imitate right from childhood what is appropriate for them. That is to say, people who are courageous, temperate, pious, free, and everything of that sort. On the other hand, they must not be clever at doing or imitating illiberal or shameful actions so that they won't acquire a taste for the real thing from imitating it. Or haven't you noticed that imitations, if they are practiced much past youth, get established in the habits and nature of body, tones of voice, and mind? I have indeed. Okay, so why is Socrates saying that our guardians should not be imitators? Or if they are imitators, it has to be of good, virtuous things. Because you can't uh, be more than two things at once. So if you're busy trying to imitate somebody else's character, you won't be as good as upholding your own. Right. And then what is the worry if they try to imitate shameful things or bad things, even if they're just joking around? Exactly, yeah. We don't want our guardians to be imitating shameful things or bad things, even if they're joking around, because that will become a part of their character. And remember, these people are supposed to be pious, just, free, courageous. So if they're going to imitate anything, they have to imitate those things and nothing else. Since those we claim to care about are men, then and men who must become good, we won't allow them to imitate a woman, young or old, as she abuses her husband, quarrels with the gods, brags because she thinks herself happy, 
or suffers misfortune and is possessed by sorrows and lamentations. And still less a woman who is ill, passionately in love, or in labor. Absolutely not. This is kind of an odd list, right? You shouldn't have guys going around imitating a woman in labor. But, I don't know, I suppose there's some logic to it. Nor must they imitate either male or female slaves doing servile actions. No, they must not. Nor cowardly bad men, it seems, or those whose actions are the opposite of what we just described just now. Men who libel and ridicule each other and use shameful language when drunk or even when sober or who wrong themselves and others by word or deed in the other ways that are typical of such people. And they must not get into the habit, I take it, of acting or talking like madmen. They must know, of course, about mad and evil men and women, but they must not do or imitate anything they do. That's absolutely true. What about metal workers or other craftsmen or those who row in triremes or their coxswains or the like? Should they imitate them? Right. And what about neighing horses, bellowing bulls, roaring rivers, the crashing sea, thunder, or the like? Will they imitate them? No. They have already been forbidden to be mad or to imitate madness. <laughs> so you are saying, if I understand you, that there is one kind of style and narration that a really good and fine person would use whenever he had to say something. And another kind, unlike that one, which his opposite by nature and education would always favor, and in which he would narrate his story. What kinds are they? In my view, when a moderate man comes upon the words or actions of a good man in the course of a narration, he will be willing to report them as if he were that man himself, and he won't be ashamed of that sort of imitation. He will be most willing to imitate the good man when he is acting in a faultless and intelligent manner but less willing and more reluctant to do so when he is upset by disease, passion, drunkenness, or some other misfortune. When he comes upon a character, however, who is beneath him, he will be unwilling to make himself resemble this inferior character in any serious way, except perhaps for a brief period in which he is doing something good. On the contrary, he will be ashamed to do something like that, both because he is unpracticed in the imitation of such people and also because to shape and mold himself on an inferior pattern disgusts him. In his mind, he despises that, except when it is for the sake of amusement. Probably so. So, Socrates has laid out the three kinds of imitation that the good person should and should not engage in. The first is that the good person will and should imitate the good person. The good person should only half imitate the good person when the good person is suffering a misfortune or a disease or is lamenting. Only half imitate. But the good person should not imitate the bad person. This is shameful and could have a bad effect on their character. Won't he use the sorts of narration then that we described in dealing with the Homeric epics a moment ago? And, though his style of speaking will involve both imitation and the other sort of narration, won't imitation play a small part even in a long story? Or am I talking nonsense? Not at all. That must indeed be the pattern followed by that sort of speaker. As for the other sort of speaker, the one who does imitate a lot, the one who is lacking the virtues... The more inferior he is, the more willing he will be to narrate anything and to consider nothing beneath him. Hence, he will undertake to imitate before a large audience and in a serious way all the things we just mentioned. Thunder and the sounds of winds, hail, axles and pulleys, trumpets, flutes, pipes and all the other instruments and even the cries of dogs, sheep and birds. And his style will consist entirely of imitation in voice and gesture, won't it? With possibly a small bit of plain narration thrown in. Yes, that must be so too. Well then, that is what I meant when I said that there are two kinds of style. And you were right, there are. Now one of them involves a little variation. Hence, 
if an appropriate harmony and rhythm are provided for this style, won't anyone who speaks it in it correctly come close to speaking in a single harmony and what is more, a rhythm of pretty much the same sort, since the variations involved in it are slight? Yes, that's precisely what you would do. What about the other kind of style? Won't it need the opposite, namely every harmony and every rhythm, if it too is going to be spoken improperly, since it is multifarious in the forms of its variations? Yes, that's very much what it is like. Now, doesn't every poet and speaker adopt a style that fits one or the other of these patterns, or a mixture of both? Necessarily. What are we to do then? Shall we admit all of these into our city, or one of the pure sorts, or the mixed one? If my view prevails, we will admit only the pure imitator of the good person. Ah, and yet, Adamantus, the mixed style is pleasing. And the one that is most pleasing to children, their tutors, and the vast majority of people is the opposite of the one you chose. But perhaps you would say that it does not harmonize with our Constitution, because there is no twofold or manifold man among us, since each does only one job. Indeed, it does not harmonize with it. And isn't that the reason that it is only in a city like ours that we will find a shoemaker who is a shoemaker, not a ship's captain who also makes shoes, and a farmer who is a farmer, not a juror who also farms? And a soldier who is a soldier, not a money maker who are also soldiers, and so on? True it is. Suppose then that a man whose wisdom enabled him to become multifarious and imitate everything were to arrive in person in our city and want to give a performance of his poems. It seems that we would bow down before him as someone holy, amazing, and pleasing. But we would tell him that there is no man like him in our city and that it is not in accord with divine law for there to be one. Then we would anoint his head with perfumes, crown him with a wooden reef, and send him away to another city. But for our own benefit, we would employ a more austere and less pleasant poet and storyteller ourselves, one who would imitate the speech of a good person and make his stories fit the patterns we laid down at the beginning when we undertook to educate our soldiers. Yes, that is what we would do if And now, my friend, it looks to me as though we have completed our discussion of the branch of musical training that deals with speech and stories. After all, we have discussed both what is to be said, good things, virtuous things, and how it is to be said. Yes, it Wouldn't what is left for us to discuss next, then, be lyric odes and songs? Clearly. And couldn't anyone discover by now what to say about what they must be like, if indeed it is going to be concordant with what has already been said? And Glaucon laughed and said, I am afraid, Socrates, that anyone does not include me. You see, it is not sufficiently clear to me at the present moment what we are to say, though I have my suspicions. What do you think Socrates is going to say? On what pattern or idea should the lyrics and the odes be based on? It's going to be the same thing as it was for the poems and the stories. What should we want our our music and our lyrical songs to do in our ideal city? Exactly, yeah. We want our songs and our lyrical odes to help produce in our people the constitutions, the characters that they're supposed to have, right? And so we're going to have different songs for the guardians that we're going to have for the craftsmen, that we're going to have for the woodworkers, that we're going to have for the shoemakers, okay? We're going to come up with songs that somehow fit into the kind of character that they should be embodying, that's going to inculcate that character in them, okay? Songs, Socrates thinks, they're not a trivial matter, okay? I know we all listen to lots of different kinds of music, lots of different kinds of genres nowadays, and we don't really think about how that music is affecting us, but Socrates is. Socrates is deeply concerned about the images and the songs and the stories and the structures 
that are being told to the people. Because we're trying to create ideal people here. And so we can't let them listen to anything. Okay? Socrates is going to say, you better not let the guardians listen to WAP. Okay? That ain't right for the guardians. All right? It's probably not right for anybody in the city, he would say. Okay? All right, would you like to take over Glaucon's part? Nonetheless, you are sufficiently clear about this. First, that a song consists of three elements, speech, harmony, and rhythm. Yes, I do know that at least. Now, as far as speech is concerned, at any rate, it is no different, is it, from speech that is not part of a song, and that it must still be spoken in conformity to the patterns we just established now? Further, the harmony and rhythm must fit the speech. Of course. But we said that there is no longer a need for dirges and lamentations in words. No, there is not. What are the lamenting harmonies then? You tell me. You are musical. The mixolydian, the syntonolydian, and some others of that sort. Here we get some cultural context. I guess these were famous rhythms that were around during that time. These harmonies, lamenting harmonies. Shouldn't we exclude them then? Because they're lamenting ones. After all, they are even useless for helping women to be as good as they should be, let alone men. We certainly should. Now surely drunkenness is also entirely inappropriate for our guardians, and softness and idleness as well. Of course. What then are the soft harmonies and the ones suitable for drinking parties? Could you use any of them, my friend, on men who are warriors, though? No, never. So it looks as though you've got the Dorian and Eurydian left. Yeah. I do not know the harmonies, so just leave me that harmony that would appropriately imitate the vocal sounds and tones of a courageous person engaged in battle. Or another work that he is forced to do, and who, even when he fails and faces wounds or death, or some other misfortune, always grapples with what chances to occur in a disciplined and resolute way. Yes, give me that harmony, whatever that harmony is. And also, leave me another harmony for when he is engaged in peaceful enterprises, or in those he is not forced to do, but does willingly, or for when he is trying to persuade someone of something, or in treating a god through prayer, or a human being through instruction and advice. Or for when he is doing the opposite, patiently listening to someone else who is entreating or instructing him, or trying to change his mind through persuasion. Leave me the harmony that will imitate him when he does not behave arrogantly when these things turn out as he intends, but on the contrary is temperate and moderate in all these enterprises and satisfied with their outcomes. Leave me these two harmonies then, the forced and the willing. That will best imitate the voices of temperate and courageous men in good fortune and in bad. You are asking to be left with the very ones I just mentioned. So what is Socrates saying here? What kinds of music should the guardians be able to listen to? Does anybody hear like slow, sad songs? With vocals that are really emotional and they... Ah, they just go right to your core. None of that for the guardians. You can't make them soft, okay? You can't make them relaxed and emotional and weepy and cry because you're listening to brand news, The Devil and God Are Raging Inside Me. Amazing album. No. You give them songs that are suited to their constitution. No sad, relaxed, soft, or songs that produce idleness, okay? Only battle music for battles and a music that is appropriate for leisurely activities. But that doesn't make them soft, okay? I don't know what these would be, but this is what Socrates is saying we need to give to the guardians, okay? Pretty much a song, a fitting song for each activity they will be engaged in. Well then, we will have no need for multi-stringed or polyharmonic instruments to accompany our odes and songs. No, it seems to me we would. 
then we won't maintain craftsmen who make triangular lutes, harps, and all other such multi-stringed and polyharmonic instruments. What about flute makers and flute players? Will you allow them into the city? Or isn't the flute the most multi-stringed of all? And aren't polyharmonic instruments all imitations of it? Why is he saying we shouldn't allow these instruments into the city? What's wrong with the multi-stringed and the polyharmonic instruments and the flutes? Socrates is going deep with this education, okay? Only certain instruments will be allowed in the city. That's that's definitely part of it. Yeah. But what's what's bad about these multi stringed instruments as he calls them? Um I kind of like was thinking about it in two ways. In like the multi stringed uh, sense of it. It's kind of like, well, what he means when he doesn't want uh craftsmen doing the job of a soldier. Uh, but I was also thinking that um, when I think of like the harp or the flute, I think of it's very feminine and soft, and I, I assume he doesn't want those sort of things associated with the garden. Right. Yeah, you're spot on. There's an idea here such that, look, we need an instrument that is suited to make the song that is going to be fit for the guardian's character. All right. We don't want instruments that are too complex that produce discordant music or music that doesn't have a good melody or a fitting melody. Flutes and harps, you could characterize them as feminine or soft sounding, not fit for the guardians, okay? You have the lyre and cithra left then as useful in our city. And in the countryside, by contrast, there would be a sort of pipe for the herdsmen to play. That is what our argument suggests, anyway. Well, we are certainly not doing anything new, my friend, in preferring Apollo and his instruments to Marcius and his. No, by Zeus, I suppose we aren't. And by the dog, we have certainly been unwittingly repurifying the city we described as luxurious a while ago. That just shows how temperate we are. <laughs> then let's complete... The purification. Now, the next topic after harmonies is the discussion of rhythms. So we need harmonies, certain harmonies to exist. Also, we should only allow certain rhythms in songs to exist. Can't allow all the rhythms in the world. That would be bad. We should not chase after complexity or multifariousness in the basic elements of the song. On the contrary, we should try to discover the rhythms of a life that is ordered and courageous, and then adapt the metrical foot and the melody to the speech characteristic of it, not the speech to them. What rhythms these would be for you is, is for you to say, just as you did in the case of the harmonies. So we're going to skip ahead here. The point that he's basically making is, look, just like we need certain instruments to produce a certain song for the guardians, those songs should only be made up of certain rhythms. Okay, We're going to start with the lyrics first, and then we're going to build a song around the lyrics rather than doing it the other way around. So let's skip to 400C. If I could find it. Or 400E, rather. So it's on page uh, 83, right? Socrates. Fine speech, then, as well as harmony, grace, and rhythm, go along with naivete. I do not mean the foolishness, for which naivete is a euphemism, but the quality of a mind a quality of a mind has when it is equipped with a truly good and fine character. Absolutely. Not knowing evil, not being enchanted by bad, unjust things. And mustn't our young people try to achieve these on every occasion? if they are going to do the job that is really theirs? Yes, they must be. Now surely painting 
and all the crafts similar to it are full of these qualities. Weaving is full of them, as are embroidery, architecture, and likewise the manufacture of implements generally. And so furthermore is the nature of bodies and that of other things that grow. For in all these there is a grace, or the lack of it, and lack of grace, bad rhythm, and disharmony are akin to bad speech and bad character, while their opposites are akin to and imitate their opposite, a character that is temperate and good. Absolutely. Is it only poets that we have to supervise then, compelling them either to embody the image of a good character in their poems or else not to practice their craft among us? Or mustn't we also supervise all the other craftsmen and forbid them to represent a character that is bad, intemperate, illiberal, and graceless in their images of living beings, in their buildings, or in any of the other products of their craft? And mustn't the one who finds this impossible be prevented from practicing in our city so that our guardians will not be brought up on images of evil as in a meadow of bad grass? where they crop and graze every day from all that surrounds them until little by little they unwittingly accumulate a great evil in their souls. Instead, we mustn't we look for craftsmen who are naturally capable of pursuing what is fine and graceful in their work so that our young people will live in a healthy place and be benefited on all sides as the influence exerted by those fine works affects their eyes and ears like a healthy breeze from wholesome regions, and imperceptibly guides them from earliest childhood into being similar to, friendly toward, and concordant with the beauty of reason? Yes, that would be by far the best indication for them. Okay. So we have to monitor not only the poets, not only the people creating the songs, but who else? Right, so what does he have in mind with craftsmen? He mentioned a few crafts. <coughs> There's an E word in there. Embroidery. We have to monitor the embroiderers. To make sure that they're not making bad images, images that can corrupt the youth. We must monitor the painters so they don't paint anything bad. We must monitor the architects so they don't build any bad buildings. Every discipline in which an image can be created or a representation can be created must be monitored so that the education of the people can be appropriate for the development of their character. Okay, we'll stop there.